afternoon. Uh, this is uh, CIBE 633, uh, environmental, excuse me, environmental, environmental hydrology. And today is the beginning of the 13th week. Right, 13th week. And uh, we have uh, two more weeks to go and then we'll, ha we'll have the presentations and then that will be the end of the semester. Uh, the subject today is uh, salinity, continuation of salinity. We have a lot of material to cover, so let me get started with it. Um, first, let me uh, share the screen. Everybody seeing a green screen? Yeah, yeah we can do that. Yeah, cool. uh, I, uh, I had mentioned earlier that I wasn't going to cover the two salinity sections or detailed salinity sections because everything is salinity. It's just that these are very detailed. Uh, I pull these two sections out of the manual and I looked at it and I believe I do have hum some homework for you to do. So rather than uh, have you do the homework without me talking about it, I decided I was going to do it. So I'm going to do kind of a brief coverage of these two papers or extract it it's really extracts i have extracted um this material from this book over here uh, this book is titled let me see agricultural salinity assessment and management it was published i believe in the year 2012 it's a second edition of ase manuals and reports of engineering practice number 71 the first edition was done in 1991. This is the second edition, third, 21 years later. This is the thicker book, more comprehensive. Uh, I just noticed that it has almost 1,100 pages. It's about as thick a book as you're going to be able to see. It's a good book. It's a highly technical book. Uh, salinity is a concept that could be dealt with from uh, an environmental, environmental uh, view or point of view, as we do. Uh, it's a broad view, but then you can also get into the chemistry. And for that purpose, you either need to be specialized in chemistry or else study the subject and become a specialist on it. Anybody could do it. If you spend some time, a few months or maybe a couple of years studying this stuff, you'll, you'll learn it. I should mention to you at this point in passing that uh, I started my career in 1968 precisely studying salinity and drainage. I did it. I did it for about a year. I actually wrote a thesis on it. It was a very basic thesis of a salinity or drainage project. So I have come back uh, 180 degrees at the end of my career, uh, going back to salinity. I I love the subject. I think the subject is as as tough as it gets. I honestly, and as has been said by several people, we're not going to be able to solve the problem. The problem is too big. It takes a lot of time and so forth. But it's good for us to understand the problem so that we can try to help uh, reduce the effects and so forth, uh, attenuate uh, the impacts of uh, salinity. Uh, we all realize that we're up against sodium chloride, and sodium chloride forms 3%, 3.5% of the solids in, in the ocean, and the ocean is extremely huge. So there's a lot of sodium chloride out, out there, and I have already mentioned that to you. So I'm going to go in here and, and skip a little bit because obviously we don't have too much time today. I need to cover four or five papers. Uh, I do want to mention that um, uh, the uh, salinity is measured by electrical conductivity. And it's made, the conductivity is opposite to the resistance. The resistance is ohms, so the conductivity is measured in MOH, MOS, is the reciprocal of the resistance, electrical resistance, electrical conductivity. It's a reciprocal. Uh, in SI units, one MO is designated as Siemens. And um, I don't know why, but that's the way they did it. When I started my career 50 years ago, Siemens was not there. It was Mohs. But then now it's it's equivalent to Siemens. We don't use Mohs anymore. I haven't heard for 30 years anybody saying Mohs at this point. Electrical conductivity is measure, measured in Siemens per centimeter 
or al alternatively in millisiemens per centimeter. In one millisiemens per centimeter is one thousand, one one over one thousand. One one millisiemens per centimeter is equal to one decisiemens per decisiemens per meter. That's the more common way to express it. Ds over m. Uh, I also, I have been interested in this for a while now, almost uh, 10 years that we came back to the issue of salinity. We did some projects, uh, water projects that there, it involves. The groundwater projects always involve sooner or later salinity. So uh, I did this calculator, which uh, references uh, DSM to electrical conductivity or the parts per million. So. For instance, in this case, we're going to have test over here, electrical conductivity, say 1 DSM. 1 DSM is a central value. In most cases, in mixed cases, I'm going to go most cases. I'm going to do a calculation. And I get over here 640 milligrams per liter. But this should be taken only as a reference. Uh, why? Because when I did this many years ago, I searched the entire web for, for an equation that would give me an equivalence. And I did. I did find that equation somewhere. I don't remember, to be honest with you. Oh, there it is. Reference, learning about salinity. Let's get there. Salinity management for, oh boy, whatever. So there's a reference in there. I thought that I had lost it, but I guess I picked it up again. I picked it up from some other source because that uh, link should not be broken. As a matter of fact, uh, about uh, six months ago, I got a, a call or, a, or an email from somebody out there in, I believe it was in Brazil, some lady that was uh, studying a PhD or something, doing a very detailed study, and she wanted to find out where did I, a reference for this equation that I have in here. Obviously, there's an equation that relates, it's a power function that relates DSM with uh, milligrams per liter. And I published the, the calculator and I put a reference in there. So she wanted me to uh, give, give, her, give her more details of the reference. And I looked and looked all over the web, I spent a lot of time on it and couldn't find it. That means that the original reference has been lost. They either shut down the server or something, something happened. So I had no control on that. So that, that that's why I'm going to say that this calculator is a little bit chancy. I think it's the best we can do at the time, but there's very little information in regard to how you convert DSM to milligrams per liter. But take the value 640 as a reference. So two DSM would be like 1280 and something like that. So let me go back in here now. Oh, I got lost in here. Salinity and irrigation. So that's the reference and now we already know that. Uh, the, in, in soils, there's not only, only a problem of salinity, but, but also sodicity, which is somewhat different. The sodicity has to do with, um, uh, well, salinity is all the salinity. Sodium chloride is one of them. So this it is only sodium. So there's, there's relations that, um, that we learn in uh, soil physics and soil chemistry is it mostly agricultural work because Salinity and sodicity plague uh, productivity in agriculture. So those people that are engaged in enhancing the productivity of agriculture, they have to learn all this stuff. They're specialists in soils from the agronomic standpoint. There's, another, there's other people that are specialists in soils from the geologic standpoint. Those are not, those are called, those are different, a different brand of specialists. They're called I believe it's called pedologist, but, but I could be wrong on that. I haven't seen this in a while. So let me just hop, hop over in here. This is a, a major, this is a measure of the of to, to salinity. Then we have weathering. Weathering is very important. Very important that we understand that. Not too many people understand this issue of weathering, by the way. In the first issue of the of the Manual 71, which I read extensively maybe 20, 25 years ago when it came out, they didn't say a whole lot. But 30 years later, no, it's uh, 12, 23 years later, they, they put together the second version, the Green Book, in which they really talk about it 
in a more extensive way. What is it, the weathering? The weathering produces salts. Prior to us being over here, the salts ended up in the ocean. That is understood, that is accepted, is knowledge, okay? So since weathering keeps going on, we're still producing salts. Now, if we, in an anthropogenic way, meaning human influence, uh, produce more weathering, that means we're increasing the amounts of salts. That's all there is to it. And that's what the manual says, okay? Unweathered minerals provide plant nutrients, but they're also a source of soil salinity. I, I think I have said that before. I refer to the package. Remember, you have a, a package of chocolate. You want the chocolate. You eat the chocolate, but you don't know what to do with the package, so you throw it away. That's exactly what happens in the case of soils. The magnesium and the potassium are mostly uh, used by the plants, by the, by the biota, by the biosphere. But the sodium and calcium appear in large quantities, and, and about half of it is not used, or even more than half. So they have to be wasted as if it were trash. As a matter of fact, it is trash, because so much of it abounds that it cannot be handled. Anything in excess is always considered to be disposed of, surplus. Okay? Increases in salt content of 200 to 300 milligrams per liter are common when arid land soil solutions remain in contact with relatively unweathered soil minerals for substantial periods of time. That basically means that if you, that if you run water through a desert, you end up with a lot of salt downstream because the water has a way of picking up the nutrients in the soil and then washing them down by gravity. So implicit in this statement is that we're going to have problems with salts if we uh, irrigate arid lands, because arid lands are relatively new from a geologic standpoint. Uh, amount of salt dissolved under such conditions depends on the quantity of carbon dioxide. We, this is something very interesting because carbon dioxide is always there and is always qualifying or quantifying. Carbon dioxide is the byproduct of, of animals breathing, respiring, okay? And the animal, there's all kinds of animals out there, not just us. So uh, the more animal activity, the more carbon dioxide, and that is going to affect the amount of salt dissolved. Um, the solution of primary minerals is most important when the irrigation water content is low. This is kind of a fascinating story. If you have a, a lot of salt in the water, you're, you're damned because you got a lot of salt in the water. But if you don't have salt in the water, the water is clean, it goes in there and it sweeps through the soil and it produces a lot of salt that was already in the soil anyway. So you don't win in this situation. You really don't win. We don't win against salt, basically. That's the idea. As a matter of fact, this was very clearly explained by none other than Van Schildkart, who was, uh, I believe, originated in the Netherlands, but he worked in the U.S. at the, at the uh, Salinity Lab the USDA Salinity Lab in Riverside. And uh, I'll get to that story later on. It's a very good story. As a matter of fact, we're gonna review his paper. Okay, irrigation in bold. This is important. That's why I put it in bold. Irrigation with water from California's Feather River, which has a salt content of 50, 60 milligrams per liter, which is hardly anything, result, results in more salt in the drain water due to weathering than due to the salt content of the irrigation water. In other words, you run 60 milligrams through the soil and you end up with 150 milligrams downstream. Where, are the other com where did the other come from? It came from the weathering because, because that clean water is thirsty for salt. That's all there is to it. Uh, water wants to carry a certain amount or the, it has a kind of an equilibrium value that it wants to carry. And if it doesn't have it, it will pick it up wherever it is. This happens not only with salts, dissolved solids, it also happens with sediment, by the way. We study that next year. Okay, uh, when irrigation waters have a moderate amount of salt, such as 800 milligrams per liter that occurs in the Colorado River, in the lower reaches of the Colorado, it's 800 milligrams per liter, I already told you that. And it varies between 750 and 800. In leaching fractions are below 0.25, salts precipitated in the soil profile 
exceeded, exceed the amount weather. So basically what they're saying in here in the manual is that you got to consider both the salts that came in as well as the salts that were already there that were generated by the process of watering or irrigation. Leaching fraction. We are going to define, we're going to define leaching fraction later on. As a matter of fact, I have a, a homework for you to do with leaching fractions. And in order to do your homework, you got to review this paper, but in particular, this, the next paper, which is the one that has the methodology. And I do caution that this stuff's not straightforward. It is tricky. It is just straight algebra, but it is tricky. You got to be spatially minded to figure out exactly what is going on. Believe me, I know from experience. Leaching requirements. So, in other words, what happens is this. You apply water to the irrigation system, but there's salts everywhere. The salts coming from the water, the salts that were already there, the salts that are not, are, are not outside, but, but are inside of the house, so to speak, that you gotta, they've got to be leached before they can be considered salt in the solution. And plus, you're adding a few stuff in there that are not necessarily sodium chloride. Nobody's going to add sodium chloride, but you can add some of the salts. And those can be wasted also due to rain and so forth. So you, there's four sources of salts, which, by the way, we already looked into when we looked at the problem of the South on Sea about a couple of weeks ago. So the leaching fraction is the fraction that needs to be applied to the soil in excess of the consumptive use in order to remove the salts. In other words, if you have 100 units of consumptive use, you got to add 120 or 110 or 130 units of water. Because if you don't, then the salt will accumulate. And then within a year or two, I don't know if it's a year or two, but it eventually it would not let you grow anything in the soil. You would have to wash the soil. Um, that happened in uh, Imperial Valley in the year 1900. In the, by the year 1904, they were saturated with salt and they realized that they had to do something about it. Either quit, go somewhere else, or drain it. And they decided to drain it. And they built the entire valley, as I understand it, is built over a set of tiles, fil filtered tiles that have the, the, the objective of of uh, calling in the water into the tile so that it can be drained readily rather than just wait on nature to do it. You could have waited in na on nature to do it, but that was chancy. So they said, these people were in business and they wanted to make money. They said, well, if we put some tiles in there, it's been proven that it'll help. It'll increase the rate of removal of the salty water. And sure enough, it happens that way. The tile produces a gradient. A gradient moves the salt, moves the water, moves the flow and therefore it, it drains rather quickly. Uh, properly designed, of course. These have to be designed uh, technically. Okay, so definition of leaching fraction. We have three definitions, but the most common is the ratio of the depth of drainage to the depth of applied water. And the depth of applied water is the irrigation plus the rainfall, because normally if you have 100 units of consumptive use of the crop, if there's 80, uh, if there's 20 of rainfall, then 80 would have to be applied. You don't want to apply more because you'll be wasting the water uh, more than the consumptive use. But you still have to, have to apply more because you need to wash the soil, apply the so-called leaching fraction. Ratio of salt content of applied water. That's the second definition. We're going to forego that. Salt tolerance. Variation of relative yield of corn with soil salinity. This is just corn. This is one graph of corn that I got out of the book. Basically, this says that the electric conductivity in DSM per meter over here, and um, if, if this goes up, the soil, uh, the, the soil becomes more saline, and therefore it is less capable of production. In the case of corn, the, the efficiency of 100% goes up to 3.6, at which time it starts decreasing. So this should be read like this that if you have an electrical conductivity of 6 DSM per meter, then the yield would only be 70%, the yield of corn. And if the conductivity were to be 10, which is extremely large, by the way, then the productivity would be zero. 
you don't want to get there. I mean, you want 100 units, you don't want 30, 40 units. That would not be productive in terms of economic, uh, in economic terms, right? You want to make the best productivity. And that's why we need to leach the soil of, leach the soil. You have to leach the soil if the water is salty, which in the case of the Colorado, it is. If the, if the water, if the soil is new, in the case of uh, arid lands or semi-arid lands, you still have to leach the water. You have to provide some removal of the salts. This is expensive, it's difficult, and but it's done. It's, it, was, it, it has been done successfully in the Imperial Valley, but with the, with the problem of creation of the Southern Sea. It has been done more or less successfully in the San Joaquin Valley, but the salts that are generated are being drained through the river that we mentioned the other day, and it goes into San Francisco, into, into San Francisco Bay. Okay, uh, leaf burn due to excessive sodium. Excessive sodium caused that problem. Okay, and uh, leaching for salinity control. The electrical conductivity in here, relative crop yield. This, this, so, okay, so in here we have an example here. For example, given a, an ESSS of 10, if you go, a sensitive crop would have, we have no production because it's a sensitive crop. Moderately sensitive, we have 47%. Moderately tolerant, 78%. In a very tolerant crop, would have 100, would have 100%. In other words, crops differ as to their capability to handle the salt. Uh, tomatoes, for instance, are very tolerant. But other plants like corn and I assume potatoes, I'm not quite sure of that. Um, the, the regular the regular crops that we always eat are not tolerant. The tomatoes are an exception, but there are some salt, some like some nuts out there. They they can take quite a bit of salt. So if you are in a salty situation, then you got to manage what you have, right? If you can grow stuff that is tolerant, tolerant or moderately tolerant, it will still grow for a while anyway. But you still generate a lot of salts, no matter what. Anytime you do some living, meaning you live and you eat the plants and the plants live too, salt has to be generated. That is how we got the ocean full of salt. That is a fact. Salt is the byproduct of the, of the functioning of the biosphere. Okay, so estimating the leaching fraction. Okay, he would define the leaching fraction and we have this graph in here, which is a new graph, by the way. This graph did not exist in the previous edition of the manual. So I am to understand that the people that wrote this manual, which is the best of the United States, the best agronomists and soil scientists in the United States, uh, many of them concentrated in the salinity Riverside, salinity lab, U.S. salinity lab in Riverside, University of California, Riverside. Part of the University of California, it was also part of ARS, I believe, the Agricultural Research Service. I actually visited them uh, many years ago. 13 years ago, and they have this graph over here. This graph should be understood like this. It's a kind of a simple graph. You have the conductivity of the irrigation water and the conductivity of the soil. So you have, for instance, in here, 4 and 12. 4 and 12. So the leaching fraction should be 0.15. And we are going to define later on in more precise detail precise detail what the leaching fraction, how, how the leaching fraction is defined. Actually, we already have. It's what you have to leach is in, in terms of what the consumptive use. No, in terms of the total. There's a little bit of confusion in there. But it's not, there's not confusion because it's all spelled out in here. So that's the way we use this graph. And finally, we have an example in here, in here and I urge you to review this, these equations because they look easy, but they're not easy. Okay, I spent a lot of time doing this, okay, and, and, and clarifying it for you because it is not clear in the manual, okay? And nothing's clear in the manuals. Uh, the, the leaching fraction, they call it LF, how best to call it. The water, amount of water to be leached, water leached, WL, and CU is the crop consumptive use of water. 
The consumptive use of water is a subject of calculation. Every crop, depending on the weather, local weather and temperature and so on and so forth, is a consumptive use of water. You do that by month and then you add it up to year and that's what you're supposed to use. You shouldn't use more or less. Well, you actually end up, end up using more because of the leaching requirement, but you should not use less because then the plant suffers and it doesn't like to produce. Okay, so review these equations, and with these equations, you will be able to solve the problem of the homework. In the relative crop, crop yield in saline areas, there is an equation, which is this equation over here. And again, this is just straight algebra, so I'm going to go over rather lightly on it. Basically, what happens is this. I already seen, you already seen this. It starts decreasing over here. And every, every, um, crop has a line over there, has a point over here and, a, and then a slope. And the point is given by, it's over here, it's over here. A is the point, the tolerance, tolerance threshold, and B is the slope, the slope of the line of yield. So review this, this is a straight algebra, so that one could do a calculation of the relative yield using this graph, which we have already seen. Okay, so now we already spent 25 minutes. Okay, so we uh, I'm going to skip over these because they're not that important and we don't have the time to, but I do, I am going to spend a few minutes showing you this graph, which I believe you should examine. Uh, it's a geographical chart. Uh, the largest salinity, Don Juan Pond in Antarctica, it has a salinity of 400, 400 PPT, parts per thousand. In other words, 400 parts per million. Uh, this is about as salty as it gets. Uh, I understood that the uh, saturation level was 360. So I'm really surprised. I'm not gonna argue with this gentleman. He's a professor of geology, mineralogy as a matter of fact. But uh, 400 must be an exception because it is maybe in Antarctica or something like that. But 360 is the accepted value. As a matter of fact, outside of Antarctica, you have the Lake Asal in the Buji, which was one of the countries, I believe, somewhere out there in the in Africa or East. I, honestly, there are, there are 200 countries in the world, and I don't know all of them. But these are the lakes, the, the salinity of the lakes. Different lakes have different salinities. The ocean has a certain salinity. Uh, what... Uh, what conditions the salinity of a lake? Well, it depends. What if, if, it's, if they're totally uh, close, it's because of age. And if they're not close, depending on how big the mouth or the outlet is. If, if the outlet is big, then the salinity is going to be very low. If the outlet is, is very small, there's still going to be some salinity. And we have some comparisons in our, in one, in the, in our geomorphology paper, which I kind of read skimpily with you, but uh, we have a case of Lake Titicaca, which is one PPT, because it drains. It drains 2% of its volume, 2% of its annual volume. Uh, a discharge is 2% of its annual volume. Um, and you also compare that with, uh, with uh, the Caspian Sea, uh, east of Russia and west of Asia, Turkmenistan, actually where the salinity is 13. So it's 13 times more that of Lake Titicaca. And they're both lakes. Why? Because Lake Titicaca drains while the other one drains, but not so much. It actually drains into a pit, which we, we I have briefly discussed that. Uh, as a matter of fact, I believe that pit's over here. Yeah, right here, this red one. Karavoskalgo, Karavogasko is adjacent to the Caspian Sea, is the dump of the Caspian Sea. So in other words, the Caspian Sea has a dump, like, like a Southern Sea. If, if the Imperial Valley would not, did not have the Southern Sea, it would be a dump, it would be full of salt, we couldn't oper operate there. But it does have a convenient dump very close to it. So the Caspian Sea has Garagobasco also. And Garagobasco is 340, 350, as you can see, very high out there. It is almost full of salt. It's like Kuyuni, by the way. And I, I'm, I'm interested, I'm, it's, I'm curious to see, yeah, that's right. 
Lake Cuyuni in Bolivia is not on this chart. And it is a very important one because it happens to be the largest salt, salt pan or salt uh, flat. So it's missing from this chart. No, nobody's perfect. And as you can see, we have various lakes in here uh, in area. These are given as area, Lake Ontario, Lake Superior. Lake Superior has almost zero salinity. Lake Superior is considered to be one of the cleanest, if not the cleanest lake in the world. It has only 60, 60, 60, hardly anything. It's the lowest I have ever seen, 60, naturally speaking. Why is Lake Superior so clean? And the answer is because its environment is, is old. It's an old geologic environment. It's a jungle, basically. It's a temperate or boreal, boreal actually, boreal, jung uh, boreal forest. And it doesn't have salt. The salts are already drained, and they drain through uh, St. Lawrence River, and the St. Lawrence River is a big, big river. So it draws all the salts. It has been for many, many years, millennia, thousands, millions of year, years, been draining all the salt from central Canada and northern the United States. We're talking here Minnesota and parts of Michigan. Okay, so I'm done there. Uh, I urge you to examine this to learn where is the salt and why is it that is in there. Now, we have this paper by Van Schilfgaard, uh, whom I, I have already introduced the gentleman. It doesn't say Van Schilfgaard in there because they don't put, they don't put his name in the book, but he wrote this, this, uh, this article. This is interesting, fascinating. That first edition of that book had 28 chapters, and the last chapter is this one. It is titled Irrigated Agriculture. Is it sustainable? Because in the first 27 chapters, they undertook to do how you do it. And then the 28th chapter, they undertook to ask the question, should we be doing this? I thought that was the first time ever that I saw anything like this. Typically, people don't talk about, should we be doing this? They just go ahead and do it, right? You can figure it out later. But in this case, don't forget that this is 1991, is the beginning of the environmental movement. And so these people felt the need to ask the question, at least ask the question. And, and Van Schilfgaard does not answer clearly the question. He puts a lot of ifs and buts out there. And I urge you to read this paper. It's an interesting, very fascinating paper, very complete paper, very knowledgeable gentleman. Not only knowledgeable with facts, but also with experience. These gentlemen have been working with the USDA for all oh, 30 years at least at that time. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good paper to read for background information. However, it's too long for us to get into all the details. So I have summarized it for you and I'm going to hear, going to go over it, the highlights of that paper. Irrigated agriculture has been practiced for more than 10,000 years. Is that true? Yes, the Chinese. <laughs> The Chinese invented agriculture, irrigated agriculture, about 10,000 years ago, uh, culture in China. As a matter of fact, they, it's been recorded that it's 1,100 years, 11,000, excuse me, 11,000 years. Uh, they developed uh, rice and so forth. And uh, so we had irrigation for 10,000 years. Productivity from irrigated lands tends to be higher than rain-fed dry land agriculture. Yes. Correct. Because there's there's more precision in the way we do it. We do it. We're engineering it. Not, we're not letting nature do it happen stance, you know. So 25% of all crops in the United States originate in 10% of the land. California is very uh, productive uh, in terms of agriculture because we have we uh, half of California, the southern part, it is dry and it, it is very uh, fertile. We can bring the water from the north. We can bring the, bring the water from the east. And that's exactly what we're doing. And we can be doing irrigation. And we've been doing irrigation in California for 120 years, ever since the government created the Bureau of Reclamation. As a matter of fact, it says in the book, Bureau to, Bureau to Reclaim Lands for Agriculture. 
So the Bureau of Reclamation is the Reclamation on Lands for Agriculture, 1903. So the Bureau of Reclamation has been operating for 118 years, and they helped us a whole lot. Part of irrigation is delivering the water. So the Bureau of Reclamation became the, the hydraulic agency, the hydraulic agency. We have several water agencies, but the Bureau of Reclamation has been the hydraulic agency since its inception. Uh, the channels, the dams, and so forth. They published a lot of books, and uh, all hydraulic engineers, I do believe, uh, have a lot of respect for the work that the Bureau of Reclamation has done in the last 120 years. Irrigation in arid or semi-arid regions always degrades water quality downstream. Why do we say arid and semi-arid? We have the fulcrum, the center of the spectrum is at 800 millimeters. Anything below is from 400 to 800, we classify that as semi-arid. And from 200 to 100, 200 to 400 is arid. So those have less water, have had less water, geologically speaking, and therefore less drainage. And therefore they have more salts. They have more good salts and bad salts. They have the magnesium and the potassium, and they also have the sodium and the calcium. So irrigation releases those like a package, and then it degrades water quality downstream. Now, had we understood that, I am putting a, a, a hypothetical question. Had we understood the effects, maybe, the, maybe we would have never done it. But that is a, a moot case because human beings always do things they, don't, they really don't know. And then eventually they have to confront with the realities of the facts, of the science and so forth. A case in point is global warming. A uh, hundred years ago, nobody knew anything about it. And even to, to, to 10, 15 years before Vice President Gore, people really common, normal, I mean, mortals were not concerned or were not uh, knowledgeable on the issue of global warming. Global warming has only mushroom in the last 15 years since Gore uh, wrote, uh, did his video. You guys would remember, 2005. So it's only been 16 years that global warming or global climate change has been in the public discourse. But it's 100 years since, since people, the scientists, started uh, looking at it carefully. Drainage waters from irrigated lands carry salt that requires disposal. Can irrigation be sustained indefinitely? So that's the first question that he poses at the beginning of the paper. And I thought he was going to answer it, and he didn't. And he didn't because, let's just say, we don't, have, we don't know how to explain it. Egyptians depended on irrigation. In this basin, there were drainage problems. Yes, they have gravity problems. I was in, the, in this basin in the year 1976. Uh, they put together a whole bunch of channels, the link canals, where I worked on for my PhD dissertation. Later on, I found out through the media and so forth that they were having drainage problems because there's, uh, there was lack of gravity. You have, to, you have to have gravity in order to drain. And they were, there was lack of gravity, so they were having water logging. And when you have water logging, then the salt comes up to the surface and doesn't let you do anything. Discovery of selenium in the biota, which fed on Kessiston Reservoir, has led to renewed evaluation of the disposal of agricultural drainage. In other words, you have drainage, you got to dispose it, you got to collect it, you got to put it into some place where nobody would, would see it. And theoretically, that's the ocean. If you can get it to the ocean, so much the better. If you're in a coastal state, good. California is a coastal state. That means it's closed. Well, we got exceptions like the Southern Sea. We couldn't do it in the Southern Sea because you got uh, you got the uh, coastal range in the middle. You got to put a tunnel together, and it hasn't been done, of course, and I don't think it'll ever been done. It never will be done. Okay. Uh, but uh, in the case of Kesterton, it was it was interesting. How that happened? Well, I think I already mentioned this that um, that um, Westland Waters Dis Water District in the San Joaquin Valley was not allowed to finish their drain that they had to do, and they had to do the drain otherwise they're going to be salinized and waterlogged. So they capped it at Kesterton and left it there for a while, maybe five ten years, and then all of a sudden the birds fed on the water or drank the water and became ill and sick. And the scientists that went on to take a look at that, uh, the fish biologists, uh, rather the wildlife biologists, realized that there was an excessive amount of selenium 
in the, at the Gaston, Gasterton Reservoir, they had accumulated. So the question at that point is, where did this old selenium come from? And then the answer was very clear later on after studies. The Central Valley is full of selenium, only that it is spread. And when you drain it, you concentrate the selenium. And that's a fact of drainage also. They concentrate the selenium. Selenium is everywhere in the Central Valley. I've been there and I talk to people that know. Uh, if it's, if it's uh, selenium is in parts per billion is a micronutrient and in parts per million it's a toxic, uh, uh, I guess it's very toxic. So it, it multiplied by a thousand and you end up with something very toxic. Uh, so we need to stay away from that, from the toxicity of selenium, obviously. Yeah, that could kill people too, not just animals. Uh, selenium originated in the geology. So we were blessed, if you can put it, call it blessed, by, by nature, because she gave us a lot of selenium. And that's in the luck. It's in the luck of the draw, because other places don't have as much selenium as California. All irrigation enterprises face problems, problems of salinity management. All must consider the safe disposal of wastewater. Why is it that, for instance, there's no salinity out there in the Midwest? The Midwest doesn't have salinity. Why? Because they don't irrigate, plus they don't have any salts anymore. All those salts washed out a long time ago. That happened when I was in India. They were, they were irrigating a lot, and I asked them if they had salinity problems. And they said, salinity? We? We don't have salinity here. And sure enough, they sit at around 800, 900, million, 800 to 1,000 millimeters of rain. Therefore, a long time ago, all the salt that was supposed to drain, it drained already. It goes without saying, the more water in the environment, the less salt. Salinity, another contaminant. Salinity has been recognized for a long time. Ignoring salinity is often due to politics. That is true. Everything we do in environmental science, environmental engineering, is somewhat related to politics because eventually the politicians need to make the decisions. And it is the people that vote in the politicians. The politicians need to be, need to understand the factual concepts and oftentimes they don't by the way i say that the truth some politicians don't understand the concepts of science i don't need to get into details and i don't want to okay many engineers have devoted their careers to salinity management one of them is van Schildkart, who is writing this this has long been recognized that salinity management requires removing excess salts from the root zone High concentrations of selenium, molybdenum, arsenic, and boron were found in Kesterton. These minerals originate in the soil of rock. Conditions are to be found similar to Kesterton are to be found elsewhere. Knowledge of local and regional geochemistry becomes paramount to the long-term success of a project. Long-term success. Hmm. Uh, I believe eventually something would have to be done. And we'll have examples of that. Managing irrigation wastewater has become difficult and controversial. Controversial, that is true. That's an understatement. It's everywhere and it's a mess. Well, you know, but we are getting out of it, something out of it. We're just technically not completely solving the entire problem. And this is not the first place where we do this, by the way. Irrigation must have drainage. In some instances, the natural drainage rate is sufficient to meet this need. I have an example. When I was in Poway in the year 2012, I was talking to, and I, I told the story in a video that I am going to, I'm going to put in here for you to, to see. I believe I have not, but I will. I always do that. I write it down so that I can, I can. And I was talking to the owner of a avocado grove. They have a lot of avocado groves out there. And they, they had a lot of avocados. The, the, the tree was full of avocados. That's a crop because every, every avocado uh, sells for a buck fifty or so. Sometimes in some places where they charge two dollars for an avocado. I said, there's a lot of bucks in here. Did it rain a whole lot this year? I said, just I was kind of curious and I was I didn't know really. I didn't know the full story. I said, did it rain a whole lot this year? And he said, no, not this year. It rained last year. And I immediately realized what he had said because I knew the history of the hydrology. In seven, eight, nine, ten 10 had been dry years. 
and in the dry years, the salt was let to accumulate. So before you can have a very productive year, which was 12, they had to have drainage, which is 11. So when it rained a whole lot, it drained the whole thing, it cleaned the whole thing, it went downstream. Where did it grow? Well, there's a reservoir downstream where all the irrigation eventually gets there. I can't tell you how long it takes, but it's within a few miles, maybe five, 10 miles. I believe that's the one that it's on the dam. The memory, my memory is not helping me today, but uh, the, the, all that salt goes to the reservoir. The other reservoir is big and the salt, that salt is not a whole lot, but it's a few trees only, but that's, that's an indication. So the concept of leaching fraction and leaching requirement have been developed. Salt must be removed from the system and we have a calculation for that. In most, and, and we have technology already based on the manual that I've shown you that allows us to do a more or less precise calculation for how much the leaching fraction should be. Okay, in most natural system systems, upland drainage finds its way into rivers and into oceans, yes. So the true meaning of rivers is to carry not only the water, but also the salts. As a matter of fact, Thank God that there's water, there's runoff, because the water is carrying the salt. If there were if there were no rivers, we would be stuck with all the salt. That's basically it. So the, the rivers carry the salt. How much do they carry? That depends. There are rivers, very clean rivers, like the one that I mentioned in California, in Northern California, in that triangle on the northwest of California. Uh, there's a river that is 80 ppm, which is one of the lowest in the world, 80 ppm. Compare that to 60 ppm over in Superior, but that's a Lake Superior, not this particular river I'm mentioning. But the normal background noise on ppm salinity is 200 to 300, but the Colorado has 800. And there are some rivers out there salty that have 1,000 and even 1,500. So that's kind of the range of variation. Okay, uh, EPA estimated that one third of the salt in the Colorado River can be attributed to irrigation. See, what happened was this, that prior to irrigation, the Colorado River had about 600 ppm. That's the natural background. It was still high because it was draining the salts that were produced in the closed basin that used to be closed before the Colorado uh, Canyon broke maybe five, six million years ago, broke through. Arizona in order to get the water over here. So it was not 300, it was 600. But then 100 years later, fast forward 120 years, which is when development started over there um, in the uplands or the upper part, upper reaches of the Colorado, there's a lot of irrigation out there. So they had irrigation for the salt that had to go somewhere. They went to the Colorado. So the Colorado jumped from 600 to 800 in 100 years, just carrying the, those uh, uh, excess salts, salt from irrigation development in the, in the last 100 years. Closed basins accumulate salt. Absolute lack of drainage, drainage leads to changes. All irrigation ultimately degrades water quality for some uses. The, a permanent irrigation agriculture, a benefit, requires a sacrifice of some value elsewhere loss that no better example than the Salton Sea. Okay, the strategies, the salts need to be removed eventually. As I told you, the case of Poway, they were, they were lucky that that happened. They had to have a whole lot of water to carry all that salt out and then make a, a clean slate for the, for the tree to get started. And that was in the year 2012. Comparing the options, it may be assumed that the use of land for irrigated agriculture is the preferred choice. And that's what we decided in the year 1900 when Teddy Roosevelt created the Bureau of Reclamation because he said, we had to develop, develop uh, California and we're not gonna do it if we don't support the, the settlers of California. That's exactly the way it happened, by the way. I read it in a book. The book is called, uh, I believe, uh, Miracle Mile or something like this. It's an excellent book, by the way. Uh, if you're interested uh, in reading that book, just for the heck of it, to learn more about the water issues in the Western United States, I can, I can get the title for you. Uh, 
So um, where was I? Who pays for the cost? The irrigation is, the issue is not resolved, like in the South, Southland Sea. The people that are irrigating in the Imperial Valley, uh, the, I don't know exactly how much, I, I, I think it's 2,000 acres, but don't get me on that figure. I know I have a friend, very good friend, he, she supports me a lot, uh, who her family owns 2,000 acres out there. So I'm guessing from that figure that many other families also own 2,000 acres. There's 200,000 acres, so 200,000, 2,000, so they're looking at uh, 100, 100, right? 100 families. Yeah, 100 families is a good number, okay? Don't, don't get me on those figures because I'm just pulling it, I'm pulling them out from the air. I know 200,000 acres is the Imperial Valley, and I know this lady has 2,000 acres. So it's 200, the ratio is 200, or rather 100, by the way. Okay, uh, the Bureau of Reclamation was created in 1902 to reclaim Western lands. Reclaim means irrigate. Irrigate means degrade downstream water quality. Benefits of irrigation have been allocated. Losses is, have not been paid. It can no longer be taken for granted that irrigated agriculture should be subsidized and protected. Societal values have changed. Now, by the way, I just read the last chapter of this new issue, and it doesn't have the Von Schildgard report or paper. So the, the stuff we're reading here is dated because it's part of the first edition, not the second edition. I just they decided that they we're not going to talk that clear about the situation. I'm 100% behind Shivkar. I think he's correctly talking what should be said. If you cannot face the reality, then you're gonna, it gets going to get worse and worse. That's the reality, the facts. Societal values have changed. The issues of water rights in versus conservation. Imperial irrigation is being forced to conserve water in view of their usage of water amounts much in excess of their allocated rights. Some of that water will be saved by lining the All-American Canal. But the lining All-American Canal will have an effect on the Mexican agriculture. Why? Because the All-American Canal is right on top of the border. So whatever percolates down, down into the ground will be picked up by the Mexicans. They can pump it out. We don't because we don't, have, we don't rely in that particular region. We don't rely on groundwater. We rely on surface water. So it's not a problem for us but it will be a problem from there, from their, their standpoint. And it has been a problem. But the issue is, who owns that water? That has not been justified or clarified. And I do, believe, I do not believe the courts are in a position to clarify this issue. It's very complex. Believe me, I can tell you stories about that, and there's several. I'm not going to, I'm just going on here. Um, Society no longer considers irrigation to be the preferred use. How about that? I think it was 300, 120 years ago, but maybe not now. Should irrigation be transferred overseas where it is cheaper? That is a good question. There's a lot of irrigation in Mexico and other places, but should we have a policy of relinquishing all the irrigation to other countries? Maybe, I don't know. That's a political decision. Stability of human-generated systems remains an issue. Political forces drive the system. Political decisions are influenced by the facts and how they're per perceived, which is not the same. How they are perceived by the population, by the population at large. Costs and benefits should be identified. Holistic analysis is a must. Conclusions. Little question. These are Manchilda's conclusions, by the way, at the end of this paper. They're fascinating. Little question exists that irrigation in semi-arid climates can be sustained indefinitely. Yes or no? He appears to say yes. Salinization can be avoided by providing adequate drainage. Yes, sure, but then the issue is where you throw the stuff. Drainage exacts a price. Drainage degrades the water quality along its disposal route. Open drainage, closed drainage, and toxic drainage all exact a price. Irrigated agriculture must adapt to changing physical and societal conditions. Irrigated agriculture may flourish under the proper circumstances. Reduced subsidies may be the only way to weed out inefficient operations. Basically, he's saying here that a lot of agricultural operations have subsidies. So if you reduce the subsidies, then the inefficient operations are going to be taken out 
and only those that can't do it uh, can remain in operation. Problems of irrigation, wastewater, salinity, and contamination are not Californias. They're all over the world. And they're, they're, they're faced all over the world. Uh, the ideal situation, of course, and I think I said that, would be to live in the 800 millimeter. Because if you live in the 800 millimeters, you don't have any problems with salinity. And, and you can still produce. You cannot produce if you live in 2000. The Amazon cannot produce a whole lot of stuff. You can't produce potatoes. You cannot produce corn in the Amazon. Those are basic staples. All, all you can produce in the Amazon are nuts. <laughs> I mean, I mean... I mean nuts, you know. I don't mean people nuts, but but the, the point is that uh, uh, the nutrients are all important, and that's something we really, really should understand. It is the nutrients that are that determine uh, success or failure. The management of the nutrients that determine the success or failure. So if we can locate societies in a position where 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 we are avoiding problems, then we'll be better off. Uh, the U.S. has an 800 millimeter around Texas and a little bit north uh, in that area. The problem is that, you know, that's not a very nice area, geomorphologically speaking, to live for many people. Uh, it's very, very flat and so forth. So there's an issue here of political decisions, uh, other decisions other than technical, by the way. The technical decision from a standpoint of water should be Let's go out there to, a, to the 800 millimeter because we're going to avoid the salt problem and we're going to still be going to be able to grow our crops. Okay, so with that, I finished that and I'm going to go over now. Uh, I'm going to go over now to this third one and I'm going to be spending the next 15 minutes, which is not fair for this paper. I spent a whole lot of time writing this paper. And, but I'm only going to use 15 minutes, uh, actually 20 minutes, 20, 19 minutes on it. So what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to ask you to read this paper carefully, more carefully or with spending more time than I would spend now. But basically, I'm saying this. The summary of this paper is, we cannot afford to shut all the water on the grounds that it is precious, because if we shut all the water and keep all the water, we will also keep all the salts. And eventually, it will ruin us. The problem is that eventually, it takes time. We have calculated that it may take 100, 200, 300 years for the eventually to show up, as it has happened in Tulare Basin. Remember I told you the other day that I asked the engineer in the field, how long were they going to last? And he says, we, I think we got 60 years for sure. 60 years. And they've been operating, operating since the 1920s or 30s, actually, out there. 20s or 30s. So 20, so they, they've been there for 100 years, and they expected 60. Well, it was 10 years ago, so it's only 50. So you see there's a time, but that time is usually measured in three or four or five generations, and we're very likely to forego the consequences. We're humans. You know, we always know that we're going to live a certain amount of time. We're not going to be here forever. So it's an issue of, of it's me, you know. I don't really care. That is the issue here. We should all care, though, because, I mean, why the issue of sustainability is important. Why should we, should we leave the world in a, in a messy situation or worse than it was when we came in? And that's actually what's happened. That's all, that's all there is to sustainability. So that's what we're going to do. First, the origin of sea salt. The total amount of water has been estimated 1.5 billion cubic kilometers. About 97% is in the ocean. The ocean contains 35 kilograms per cubic meter of sea water. So that is 50 times 10 to the 15 metric tons, an enormous quantity. Scientists are not sure of the source of all this salt. But it is generally agreed that it must have, been origi must have originated in the constituents of the terrestrial rocks. We believe that to be the case. 4.6 bil billion years is a lot of years. And two kilograms per ton is a lot of rocks, a lot of salt. It's a, it's a, I think it's two kilo, it's two percent, whatever it is, two percent of rocks or salts in the in the rocks. There's there's a lot of salt in the rocks. 
good salt, bad salt, but salt nevertheless. There's a definition from a chemical standpoint for what is a salt. Uh, the more common ones that we know is a common salt, you know, that we use to, to, to sprinkle in our salads, that's sodium chloride. That's the one that we believe, and we have said this in the past, that is uh, a little bit disrespectful in the era of nature. It is the one that is not used. That's why it's wasted, and that's why it, accum it accumulates in the ocean. Because even calcium sulfate is used in the ocean, in shells. Remember the paper, the early paper that we wrote on the salinity of the ocean, uh, but not sodium chloride. Largely is wasted. Nature of the salt, I'm not going to stress too much on it because it's chemi chemistry, it is, it is thick. But let me just show it to you in here. We have the halite mineral, which is the, the salt in its original form. Table salt, sources of salt. The sources of salt on those various places in here. 11 calculation in here, sodium. Percentage of total salt cations. So only cations. So we're trying to identify in here the, the, the salt cations. Where are they? Where is all this stuff that is coming back to, to haunt us? Sources of most cations. Sodium, calcium, magnesium, potassium, biosphere, hydrosphere. Nothing in the atmosphere. The source is the lithosphere. They are or they originated in the rocks. Percentages of ionic salt content in ocean water. There it is, ionic salt content. Um, in ocean water and in river water. Okay, ionic, that means the ions. Uh, so, uh, common salt, sodium chloride. It's two ions, uh, chloride, which is the anion, and, and uh, sodium, which is the cation. And look at this, the difference. In river water, the predominant cation is bicarbonate closely followed by calcium and sulfate. Chloride is low in river water. And how is it that I can, well, we already know that it, when it reached the ocean, it, it, it accumulated, the uh, sodium chloride accumulated. So you can see the, the very clear indication that in the ocean water, we have sodium chloride 85%. There's five, six of it. The rest are small because they're used. While in here in the river water, originated from the rocks as they came, it's not a whole lot. It's only 17%, uh, it's 15%, sodium and chloride. So from 15%, it went up to 86%. Differences between the ocean water and river water. Percentages of the four most common salts in the, in the lithosphere. Salt cations, the four cations. They appear about the same, look. Sodium 24, calcium 32, magnesium 18, potassium 20. So about there's about the same amount where it originate in the lithosphere. But then when they get used, they, they kind of separate. In river water, sodium and calcium. Sodium and calcium are important. Sodium and calcium are the most important ones. Those are the ones that, uh, for instance, in the Southern Sea, there's sodium and calcium. I was surprised when I looked at the Southern Sea data that sodium in Southern, the sodium chloride in the Southern Sea is only 60%. Well, in the ocean, it's 86%. So why is it that in the Southern Sea is only 60%? Because we have calcium in the Southern Sea. You see, the calcium occupies a space, so it reduces, it reduces the percentage of sodium to 60%. And that's one of the reasons why the Southern Sea is hard to solve, because if you're gonna get the salts out there, if you're gonna do anything with them, well, you could throw them in in, the, in San Pedro, some the port of San Pedro over in LA, but that would, the, the, the people in Los Angeles are gonna to have to approve that. And there's no indication that they are willing to do that. So then we get separated. I remember I said that we get separated, but that's difficult. It can be done. Nothing can, nothing can, uh, would stand in the way of technology. We could separate it. And there's been many attempts to separate it, and it works. When it works, we can separate it, then we can sell it, because there's, there should be markets for each one of these components. So these are dirty salts that they could be separated. Uh, the greatest salt mine in the world, 
I believe it's number one or number two. It's a Guerrero, Guerrero, uh, Baja California. Actually, it's not Baja California. Baja California sewer. It's the southern part of Baja California, or southern uh, Baja California. There's the largest um, uh, mine, and they're drawing salt from the water. At the time I was there, it was 20 years ago, I went to and visited because I was interested in the salts and I learned a lot, took a lot of pictures and so forth. And uh, I found out that they're actually separating. So the 85% actually is con concentrated into 99.99%. And they do a separation technique out there. So if they can do it, we could do it too. It's just, it's a technology, you know, chemist, chemistry, engi chemical engineering in order to separate the salts into its constituents. Okay, the right of nature. I have a very uh, important concept in here. And I've been asked, does nature have a right? The right typically is an issue of individuals, not of nature. So does nature have a right? But, the, but I put it in there just to make a point. The nature has a right. And uh, most people that are environmentalists would agree with me. Others that are not necessarily environmentalists would say, no, the only people that have rights are human beings, not nature. But I say here the right of nature. And I say nature has a right to drop the salts into the ocean because it's been doing it for millions of years. As a matter of fact, about four billion years, four followed by nine zeros. They've been doing it for a while, for a long time. So now we have to distinguish between, between what we call peripheral basins and non-peripheral basins. What does that mean? When you have a large continent or subcontinent like the United States, the chance is that some of your watersheds would not be peripheral, like the Great Basin. The Great Basin occupies almost the entire area of the state of Nevada and portions of of Wyoming, Utah, Montana, I believe, and a little bit of California, the edges of California. That's a totally closed basin. That means it's salty. It's salty. As a matter of fact, you just take uh, Google Earth and fly over the state of Nevada and you'll see lots of white spots. Lots of white spots as you approximate. And, and you wonder what the white spots are there. It's not like California, it's not like that now. It's not to say that California doesn't have its white spots, but California is not a white spot. Nevada is, I've seen that. So there's not a whole lot of things that could be done in Nevada. And I believe, and I say this intently, that that's the reason why 200, 100 years ago, they decided to dedicate themselves to other issues or other endeavors such as gambling and so forth because there was a lot of people in California and they needed to have a good weekend doing that thing, gambling. And you can drive to Vegas in a couple, or Reno in a couple hours or three, three or four hours and enjoy yourself for the weekend and come back. There's a lot of people in, in the, and then a, a place where, which is suited for that because it's a desert, right? You cannot grow much in it. This is not to say that there's not agriculture or animal husbandry out there, but it's small limited, not very productive. Okay, so the fundamental right of nature has been exercised. So my argument in here is that nature has to deliver it. How much? The answer is 30%. Because typically, globally, 30% of the precipitation shows up as runoff at the end, 30%. Some places is 50%, like in the case of the Amazon. Some other places, as documented by Libovich in his book, maybe 5%, maybe 2%. It varies between 2% and 90%, but 50% is the maximum and 30% is an average of runoff. So what we do though, is we go in there and we say, oh, 30% runoff, that's too much water. Don't drop it in the ocean, we need it. We're gonna irrigate. And we reduce that 30% that to 25%, to 20%, to 15%, and so on and so forth. Some people would argue uh, quite uh, wrongly, I think, that we should keep all the water because the water is precious. But then when you keep all the water, you keep all the salt, and the salt comes back to haunt you. It does. It, 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 I mean, we know that for a fact. And we don't want the salt, basically. We want the water, but not the salt. Example here, Garagobascol, I already talked about this. 
uh, Caspian Sea. This is the Caspian Sea. And it has its dump over here, which is fascinating. This must be an issue of gradient, meaning all the water from the Caspian Sea eventually makes it through this little channel over here. There's a little channel. You can hardly see it. If we blow this up, you'll see the channel in there. It's a 200 meter wide channel that connects the Caspian Sea and it flows only in that direction because of gravity. And it creates this basin, which is a salty basin. It's a, it's a salt flat. It's really a salt flat. I've not been there. I've seen pictures of it. Similar to Uyuni. It's a salt flat. The geomorphology, the geology is kind of the same. Everything is more or less the same. If the salt doesn't go to the ocean, then it's got to, it's got to accumulate somewhere. In this case, it's an extreme because this basin has a salinity of 340 or 350 it's shown by the map, the, by the figure that I showed you earlier, which is very, very high. Theoretically, 360 is the limit. But I think I already showed you that in Vida Lake over in Antarctica, it, it has reached 400. I don't know exactly why it should get that high. It seems like it is against the chemistry. The design of nature. Let me just skip over here. I only have five minutes. The design of nature. We should distinguish between the runoff coefficient C for events and the K coefficient, runoff coefficient also K for, for yield, annual. This is an annual, this is an event. The event is, is for drainage uh, on a local basis, for urban drainage, and it's based on the percent of impervious,ness okay? 100% uh, impervious would give you a coefficient of one over here. So this axis goes through this axis. While over here, you have the K, which is based on the abscissa, which is the precipitation mean average over a global terrestrial. So it's 800, is out here. 12, uh, 1500, 1600 over here and so forth. Now this is a conceptual model. Conceptual meaning that it's not supposed to be exact. It is, it's, it's a trend, it's like, a, like the runoff curve number, right, of Marcus. It's the, it's the trend, but it is a good trend. It's something that we have uh, demonstrated through experience. I didn't bother to plot data in there. I don't think it was necessary. We were presenting an idea because many people confuse these two issues, the C with the K. I, they even call the C. I decided to call it K because they, you need to set them apart. You cannot confuse one with the other. Very important concept in our field, engineering. The Amazon rainforest, the, the dry areas like Turner Reservoir in San Diego County, the design of humans, and we don't have the time to read through this, but I urge you to read this part. Number six is very important, okay? We can have, if you don't wash, if you don't provide adequate drainage, drain, adequate drainage means grad, gradient, gravity, gradient. If there's no gradient, you can't, you cannot drain. And if you can't drain, the water will become stagnant. And if you can't drain, it will start to raise above and eventually show the salt on the surface because the salt will, will be, it will dry out and it will show on the surface. It will show white, white stuff on the surface. Example, I hear I have a salinized irrigation field in the Chow Valley. This area was not drained properly and it was allowed to salinize. I took this picture about 10 years ago. I cannot tell you at this point because I have not pursued this. What have they done in order to solve this? In order to solve this, first, they got to apply a lot of water, which they don't have. And second, they got to provide, provide gravity, which this is not that far from the ocean, maybe five, maybe five miles. That's not far, by the way. Uh, uh, Peru has the advantage that is right next to the ocean. So any trash could be thrown into the ocean. Any saline trash could be thrown into the ocean more or less readily. You don't have to, and, and, and um, so all development in the coast of Peru has caused salinity problem. I can tell you many stories on that, but I'm not going to, we don't have the time. And finally, the interesting story about the Hokokan, Kohokan civilization. A lesson to be gleaned from the historic record is that the little known Hokokam civilization, which flourished in central Arizona for more than 200 years. It's been claimed that this was the only civilization 
uh, developing in the United States uh, in 1620. By the time uh, the settlers from Europe came over, 16, uh, 1580, 1600, 1620. Remember the uh, the settlement. Uh, I believe it's, it's Plymouth. I'm not quite sure. It was in 1629 until it explained disappearance. It disappeared. The uh, Hohokam civilization disappeared around 450. Floods, droughts, and salt accumulation have been used as an attempt to rationalize the demise of the Hohokam, which quite fittingly in the local Pima language means those who have vanished. Salinity stands out as the culprit. We say that. People have said, no, it was droughts, or it was, it was, it, it was, or it was floods. No, I don't, flood, I don't think floods have anything to do with it, because floods, if anything, is a blessing. Droughts could be a curse, but droughts have a, a basic uh, property. They don't last a whole lot. Three, four years, that's it. Okay, very few. We have a paper on this. We say that droughts don't, don't last more than five years. I don't want, wish anybody to have a drought for five years. But five years is better than 10 years or 20 years, right? So droughts disappear also. But salinity, once it sets in, you can't move it out. You have to spend a tremendous amount of money, which these people obviously did not have. Okay, salinity is pervasive and difficult to manage. Over the past two decades, the sustainability of irrigation has been thoroughly examined. I should update this, Manual 71, second edition. So we are saying that you got to regulate irrigation by law. In order to do that, we have to understand it. In order to regulate it, we have to have the wherewithal to regulate it. Remember, we already talked about the regulation of groundwater in California. And we have a paper coming up, I believe is by Cassidy, right? I believe Cassidy. And uh, uh, the state of California has given itself 30 years in order to, regu to regulate the problem or to solve the problem of regulation of groundwater in California. If they ever start regulating irrigation, it would take 30, 40 years too. That's my guess. Sal balance, we're gonna read Next meeting, we're going to read the paper by uh, Pillsbury on salt balance, because he is the one that originated the concept of salt balance. In the case of Tulare Lake Basin, which I'm going to ask you to read, I ran out of time. I have already talked about this extensively. Okay, it is all in here, by the way. It all, the entire story is here. I had the wherewithal to research the original publications, which went back 50, even 100 years as to what actually happened. How is it that the Larry Lake was put together? And this is all in here. And the result is this. There's three or perhaps even four large evaporation basins. They're collecting all the salt. They're not, they have not released an iota of salt into Larry Basin for the last 80 to 100 years. It's the same thing as in the Southern Sea. The difference is in the Southern Sea they created a lake, and the lake is there with the salt. In here, for some reason that I'm not un understanding, they separated the water, and they put the salt somewhere else, and then they tried to, to evaporate the water as fast as they can. As a matter of fact, there's an evaporator that I had a chance to inspect, or rather visit, inspect this two series of work. When I was there in the year 2012, they were evaporating the water. They, they had a machine that would evaporate at about eight times the rate than normal. And they figured that was success. That's true. If you, if a water evaporates at a certain rate and you create a machine that would evaporate at eight times the rate, then you're going to evaporate rather quickly. Exactly why, how and why is it, and how is it that they think they were going to solve a problem? It, it defeats me. I'm not quite sure, really. I couldn't really figure out solving a problem by evaporating the water that was put on one side. So I end there. You can have, you can run through the conclusions or a summary of what we have said earlier. So this is a very important paper. And to conclude, I must say that I've received several invitations by people to publish this paper. And I basically have sat down and do nothing because I do believe that the paper is already published. Thank you very much. So I will see you this Thursday. We have three or four more papers to read on this chapter. Thank you. Again, my 
usual message. If you have any one in the touch, get in touch with me for any reason related to this subject, just give me a buzz, send me an email. Thank you very much. Thank you.